Okay. Thank you to all our presenters for being here and for everyone. All right, thank you so much all for being here present. I know it is 3 p.m. I hope all of y'all had lunch. I know it's getting late in the day. So um, we're very thankful and grateful that you're here today. Um, as Dr. Vasquez shared, my name is Dr. Connie Marmolejo, pronouns she, hers, ella. I'm currently one of the interim co-directors at The Well, which is the health promotion department at UCR. And I'll pass it on to my colleague to introduce themselves. Yep. <clears throat> Hey, Himani. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Himani Thakur. I use she, her pronouns. I am uh, a PhD student in the Department of English at UC Davis. Um, I'm excited to be a co-presenter uh, today. Thank you. So for today's uh, first workshop, we're going to be focusing on Mental Health 101, um, but yes, we can change the next slide. But before we begin, we want to make sure that we acknowledge uh, the land that we are currently working on. So I'm going to read this passage for all of you. Uh, we at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land water and air, the Cahuila, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on those homelands. In addition, before diving into the, the workshop itself, I want to make sure that I provide space to really highlight um, the project and its funding support. So this project is funding through a patient-centered outcomes research institute. Um, it is an independent nonprofit organization, and it helps research that will provide pa patients, their caregivers, and clinicians with evidence needed to make better informed health and healthcare decisions. So all of this particular uh, research workshop series is uh, being overseen by a collective team, um, which are in this call today. So Dr. Ann Cheney, Dr. Vasquez, and other folks on this call. I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge the folks that helped create this PowerPoint for you all today. Um, so some of them are on this call and um, as well as Himali who's presenting with me today. I know Lisa's on this call as well. So thank you so much for all your time and efforts in creating this workshop series with us. So now, now let's dive into the workshop itself. So for this particular slide, I would like to know, get a, a like a feel, a sense of the room itself on the Zoom call. So if you can take some moments to put on the group chat and tell us how you're feeling today. Be as honest as possible. You're feeling tired. You're feeling um, hungry, whatever it may be. We want to make sure uh, we get a sense of the room. So I'll give you some moments to put that on the group chat. And while you're doing that, um, I want to have a reminder to have access to your basic needs. So if you need to turn off your camera, get up, go grab water, whatever it may need, that will make you feel um, engaged and comfortable in the series in, the, um, in this hour, please feel free to do so. So let's see, how is everyone feeling today? A little high stress, a little rough. Yeah, anybody else? Super stress, yes. <laughs> a straight cat. Oh no, tired, rested. Oh, okay. Dr. Yamaguchi is rested. That that's a good one. <laughs> All right. So we have a as you can see, we have a common right. A lot of folks on this call are feeling stressed or they're feeling tired, and that creates a commonality amongst the group. So um, hopefully this workshop, we want to make sure that before you leave this workshop, you leave with some actionable tools and skills. So we have put some activities at the end because if you don't leave with anything, then we didn't do our job today. So we want to make sure you leave with something. So we'll hopefully make it as engaging as possible. And feel free to add any questions on the group chat as we are continuing this conversation. All right, Kamali. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Mamadeo. So uh, the goals of our talk, just as we know, we concluded with the 
idea that a lot of us are feeling tired <laughs> and exhausted. Um, hopefully, we will be addressing how to cope with these ideas today. So the goals of our talk are to discuss spe specifically graduate student mental health, well-being, mental illness, and the differences between these terms, how these manifest in our times during graduate school, what are the services that are available to us, um, what are the ways that we can um, change our behaviors um, or align ourselves to better states of better mental health, um, and finally share some information on local and national resources for mental health. And real quickly, this is a collaboration between all the folks listed, um, and the engagement award was fun funded by the Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute. All right, so let's keep the engagement going. Um, Dr. Vasquez is going to drop a mentee link on the group chat, and we want to know, um, as a graduate and professional student, what does mental health and well-being mean to you? And as she's dropping in the group chat, there's a reasoning why we are starting off with these topics. And please let us know if you're able to access the link. Can everyone see it? Yes. Okay, cool. Are we able to share um, the answers, Dr. Vasquez? Um, I'm trying to open it, but let me let me see if I have access to it. I, I can share the responses to the Mentimeter if that's easier. Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Okay, so let's uh, read some of the responses, feeling satisfied with what I do and feel on a daily basis, being supported, intentionality, healthy distance from work when home, ability to conduct research. Okay, these are all great responses. This is really good. Okay, so thank you so much, being heard. Yes. So that's another one, uh, another one that came up twice, right? Being heard. So th th that's something that is coming in this group. And uh, we can bring up the slides back. So the reason why I wanted to start off by defining well-being and um, mental health is oftentimes well, well-being and wellness is used interchangeably. You will hear a lot of folks, um, and I'll just say for a personal um, example, I hear a lot of like colleagues say wellness, and I'm like, no, it's well-being. Um, so Wellness, the definition has been defined for decades. And when folks think about wellness, they're thinking about physical wellness, emotional wellness, financial wellness. All of those are important, but it's only a subset of well-being. So that's why we want to move beyond just focusing on one aspect of um just wellness. We want to think about well-being, the larger umbrella. Well-being is the presence of positive emotions and moods, the absence of negative emotions, satisfaction with life, fulfillment, and positive functioning. So then you might ask yourself, well, how does well-being and mental health relate? More and more research is focusing on that association between well-being and mental health. And um, there, there is more research identifying that better well-being is associated with higher mental health and mental health and well-being is an asset that can be cultivated and developed. Which leads to our next slide. Yeah, um, as um, was said in the previous slide, well-being is a wider umbrella term and um, there have been studies that have uh, studied how well-being interacts with the lives of graduate students. Um, on this slide, we have some data from the UC Berkeley Graduate Student Happiness and Well-Being Report, um, which lists various um, academic engagement, financial confidence, and all of these various predictors of graduate student well-being. 
uh, what's important to note from this study is that uh, well-being uh, is also shaped by our experiences as uh, people in different fields of study, what our degree objectives are, our living condition, as well as our identities, such as being from a group such as the LGBTQ uh, group. Um, and what the study says is that um, when you're from uh, groups that are uh, more historically marginalized, you tend to experience negative um, uh, interactions more, and therefore that can um, lead to negative impacts on our well-being. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with our struggles in graduate school that are listed over here, so I'm not going to uh, expand on them at this point, but we will be coming back um, with some more detailed examples later. So as Himali is sharing, um... When your mental health is impacted, right, especially as a graduate student, what is the association? So I did want to highlight some data reports, assessments that are very popular amongst um, college universities national, nationally wide. So one very popular study that is done by a lot of universities, it's a healthy mind study. Um, and one of their findings demonstrated that majority of students reported that experiencing emotional or mental difficulties hurt their academic performance. Now, another assessment that is very popular and highly used among ver various um, universities, so this is national data, um, is the National College Health Assessment. So a lot of universities roll this out. We actually just rolled it out um, this quarter, and I closed it in March 24th. Um, so the National College Health Assessment is focuses on various aspects of well-being. And some of the findings when we rolled it out last time showed that high loneliness, high psychological distress, low food sec security is associated with low academic performance. To dig deep a little bit uh, more, the National College Health Assessment also has the UCR data subset. And this particular data subset reported impediments to academic performance were related to stress, anxiety, sleep, and a chronic medical condition. So I shared with you national data as well as UCR specific data and really highlighting how uh, mental health and well-being are associated, but even further associated with your academic performance. So now let's dive into this term about mental health. Many of you on this call re might already know or are familiar with the term mental health, but it's also always important to have a refresher for folks that um, would like one, but also might not know exactly what I mean by mental health. So men we all have mental health. Mental health is just as important as your physical health. So it is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribu contribution to her or his community. Mental health and mental illness are not the same thing, but a lot of folks oftentimes use it interchangeably. Mental illness is also called mental health disorders, refers to a wide range of mental health conditions. So these are disorders that affect your mood, thinking, and behavior. So mental health illness impacts one out of five adults. Yeah. And uh, to lead from that, um, mental illnesses tend to be the, some of the most common health conditions in the United States, um, as leading from the previous data, one in five Americans experience mental illness each year, um, and even one in five children have serious debilitating mental illnesses. Uh, before we get into uh, other discussions of mental health um, and um, college data, we will also just briefly look at um, other aspects of um, mental health. Um, wait, go to the next slide then. So um, this is about mental health. What do we know about mental health? Um, mental health is not just, as we said, um, it is a state of well-being. Um, and like, you can already see the text on the slide, but um, Something that uh, I've sort of related this to is that our state of mental health changes, right? And something like um, 
a presentation that we as academics are very used to doing on a regular basis, you know, taking classes or something like that. Um, these can become, these which are usually positive experiences can become negative experiences if we have had a poor mental health uh, in a particular period of time. Um, At this point, uh, we have another uh, Mentimeter um, or like an engagement question. Um, I think we're going to pause the recording for this. Um, yes. Um, okay. So this is some uh, data from um, the American College Health Association survey that uh, Dr. Mamalejo mentioned earlier. Um, over here, we can see that um, there is, um, this data was collected in 2020. The survey was uh, conducted again um, over this year uh, as well. Um, as we can see, the terms that we already mentioned, uh, depression, anxiety, stress has started to show up here. So uh, the idea is that from uh, a state of um, negative mental health, of poor mental health, we are moving slowly towards um, areas of mental illness. Uh, but how does that transition happen? Um, or is it necessarily a transition? This is something that Dr. Marmadehu will soon um, tell us a little more about. Yes, so as I was briefly mentioning that overall, what we want is to ensure that all our graduate students, our population, our professional students have access to resources and know how to access them, right? So a person can experience poor mental health and not be diagnosed with a mental illness. Likewise, a person can be diagnosed with mental illness and can experience experience of physical, mental, and social well-being. So I'm gonna go on the next slide and show you one model that I um, am really a fan of that really highlights how if you have the support available to you, you have access to the resources, even if you have a mental illness, you can thrive. So ideally we want everyone to be in that flourishing stage. So all the way at the top. So this dual continuum model is divided into four quadrants. This is a model that um, has we implement at UCR. We meaning like uh, the departments, like counseling department, the well, really utilizes this in the work that we, we are doing. So in this quadrant, you see four different areas. So what it's showing you is that if you look at the dark green quadrant, someone can have high mental health with low mental illness. This is so, this, ideally we want everyone to be there, right? But it's not realistic. This is someone that has the support, all the resources, is doing amazing in school. They're, they're just thriving, right? If you look down to the purple quadrant, this is someone that has poor mental health, with low mental illness. So this is someone that is most likely struggling with their academics, they're feeling stress, they don't have a mental illness, they're just struggling at the moment, right? So what they need is resources, support to move them up to the higher quadrant. With me so far? Now, you can have someone in the blue quadrant where they have poor mental health, significant mental illness. So this can be someone, for example, that has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, a really significant mental illness, and they don't have the support. They, they are struggling. So sometimes this can be folks that are, are homeless, um, folks that are not into, uh, can access mental health resources. So they're really struggling. They need the support to move them up. They're in the languishing phase. Then we have the lighter green, which is high mental health, and they have significant mental illness. So for example, maybe someone has been diagnosed, clinically di diagnosed with anxiety, but they have the support system. They know they have access to resources and they're able to flourish. So we want everyone to be at the top. So yes, again, you can have a mental illness, thrive. You can have no mental illness, 
have poor mental health, but if you get the support that you need, you move up, you're flourishing. So this is why this model is great because we hold this model in, in mind when we're developing program, programming, when we are developing resources for our populations. So um, I wanted to make sure I really highlighted that as we continue the PowerPoint. So what causes mental illness? There's no single cause for mental illness, but there's a number of factors that can contribute your risk for mental illness. So it could be early adverse life experiences, um, experiences related to other ongoing medical conditions, such as uh, being diagnosed with cancer or diabetes, biological factors, use of alcohol or drugs, and having feelings of loneliness or isolation. Again, um, these are just general examples of what can be um, contribute to mental illness. I don't like to go too much in depth because I don't want my audience to start clinically diagnosing themselves. So again, these are just some examples. So uh, mental illness or mental health disorders refers to a wide range of mental health conditions. Some examples of mental illness are inc included, but it's not limited to depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, eating disorders, and addictive behaviors. So as we were talking in this call, but also as research is showing, most graduate students report higher rates of depression, anxiety disorders, sometimes eating disorders. So these are things that are commonly um, coming, coming up and we wanna make sure that we provide the support that they need so these rates don't continue to increase. So how does your mental health affect you? Throughout our life, we all go through various transitions. So um, as you're transitioning into adulthood, you're creating, you're, you're, you're creating your own identity, you're creating your own change, even that transition into graduate school. It's very, very different than undergraduate school. All of you on this call will, 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 will validate, right? It's just a different environment. But there's different factors that contribute to it. It could be, again, biological factors. So some examples could be... Um, there's a lot of research, if you look at like depression studies that show that if you have the same biological uh, sex pairing, let's say if, if, if the father was diagnosed with depression, most likely the son will have depression. It's just a risk factor, not that it will happen, but it's a risk factor. Um, life experiences, so such as trauma or abuse and family history of mental health problems. So those are some examples. All right. Yeah. Um, so as we've been stressing, um, the men mental health of an individual can change over time, um, especially when we're in, as Dr. Mamaleo pointed out, coming into grad school is a big uh, decision. It's a big change in our lives. So coming into graduate school, being there um, and engaging in research all that time, it can um, obviously um create situations where a person's uh, mental health um, enters into the zone of what uh, Dr. Marvin Leho mentioned was uh, as languishing. Um, but uh, an important factor over here is how our behaviors and interactions of the people around us can also affect um, our mental health. Um, and one study, um, it was found that graduate students who experience anxiety and depression, for instance, also agreed that uh, they had PIs or advisors who did not provide uh, quote unquote real mentorship. Um, so clearly there are um, factors in graduate school that can contribute to uh, a change in someone's mental health, even um, regardless of whether they are people who have experience prior with mental illness or not. And as I was uh, talking about earlier, um, this obviously also changes across um, different populations. Um, if you are someone who comes from what are known as historically marginalized backgrounds um, or from, um, different populations, then you're likely to have experiences that are not um, 
met with uh, perhaps are not experienced by uh, your advisors or your PIs or the majority of the people around you, which can again lead to uh, situations where our mental health is negatively affected. Um, you know, being international students, um, again, um, as being an international student, I can talk about how um, just having to figure out basic living situations um, can be an extremely challenging factor. Um, and, in, and that is something that I experience alongside um, things that are already uh, difficult in graduate school, you know, financial well being um, and so on. Yes. So, untreated mental health, um, and what I mean by untreated is this person has not been able to access care or support, right? And there's many factors that may contribute to that, which I'll go in the later uh, slides. But it can result in substance abuse or substance use disorder, unemployment, um, homelessness, suicide, incarceration, deter deterioration of physical health conditions. These are just a general list of examples. Right. Okay. So now we, as we jump into warning signs, it's important to explain in this setting that trying to tell the difference between what expected behaviors are and what might be the signs of mental illnesses isn't always easy. There's no easy test that can let someone know if the mental, if there is a mental illness or if actions or thoughts might be a typical behavior, right? You know the people around you better than I would know, right? So for instance, I know Dr. Vasquez better than some folks on this call just because I've worked with her. Um, I know I know how she is. So when I talk about warning signs, these are things to look for, but doesn't mean that this is this is all they, they're having issues with sleep. That means they have a mental illness. No, these are just things to look for. And keep in mind that when you look at these things, this is just out of the normal of that person. So if this is a normal, then it's not most likely not a warning sign. So some warning signs can be eating or sleeping too much or too little, pulling away from people or usual activities. So if all of a sudden you have a, a, a peer that loves to be very engaging, go out all the time, or just it's very involved, but all of a sudden, like week after week, they're not trying, they're not trying to engage with anybody, they're distancing themselves. That's a warning sign, right? What's going on? Let, 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 let's have these conversations, having low or no energy. So this one, like this is a perfect example. You're, you're feeling tired, you're feeling stressed, but is that associated to your schoolwork, to your, your lab work? There's a connection, right? So it, I, I'm feeling low, I have no energy, but it's because, you know, I'm working on some labs. I'm just, I'm just exhausted. I haven't had time to really recharge. So there's a connection for it. It's not that I'm not that alarmed. But if this person is constantly low energy, it's not like them. Now I'm alarmed. Having unexplained aches and pains. So this one, a perfect example, and uh, folks will always ask me, what do you mean by having unexplained aches and pains? When someone is in depression, and um, example would be sometimes they're laying in bed all the time, their muscles get sore. So by the time they get up, everything's like, it's hurting. So that's a, a perfect example of aches and pains, smoking, drinking, feeling unusually confused. Um, so like foggy brain, yelling or fighting, they get irritable over, over um, certain things. Sometimes that can also be associated with burnout and experiencing severe mood swings. So as you can see, as I'm mentioning each one, there can be a different connection or association for different things, okay? So this is very general, and I keep emphasizing that. When you look at warning signs, you know this person better than anybody else. You know yourself better than anybody else. So again, if, it's, if this is out of the normal and it's a continuing behavior, ding, 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 warning signs. Let's pull that peer aside. Let's have a conversation. Maybe they need some support. Let's, let, let, let's dig deep a little bit more. So other warning signs is having persistent thoughts and memories you can't get out of your head, hearing voices, thinking of harming yourself, inability to perform daily tasks. So these are more 
more higher alert, right? So like sometimes if someone can say they, they just feel helpless, hopeless, you want to make sure that this person has the support that they need. So as I, I keep mentioning, this person has the support that they need. You also want to remember your role. So this is a workshop talking about mental health 101, right? Being aware of what the warning signs are. If at any point you feel worried about a peer or someone that you know, you need to understand your role. You're not a therapist. You're not a clinician. All you can do is be there as support and know what resources to access. That is called a gatekeeper. So keep that in mind. You don't want to take on because you have to take care of your mental health as well. So be there as a support for that person. So now that I talked about warning signs, what are some risk factors? So risk factor is something that helps to create problems. So this can uh, cause individuals to be a greater risk for developing certain mental health conditions. So like I, I, some of these slides might seem very repetitive, but they have a reasoning for it. So like I shared earlier in the slides, it could be family history, chronic medical condition, lack of parental involvement, lack of available resources. We'll talk more about that, traumatic experience, experience, past abuse, or neglect. Other factors that can also, as we've been kind of pointing out, that can contribute to an individual's um, mental health, whether it's positive or negative, are um, their surroundings, um, some things that we've discussed earlier, such as basic needs, uh, living conditions, interactions with the people around them, um, and um, how these um, increase or buffer our mental health uh, can obviously interact with uh, risk factors that already places perhaps at the uh, risk of mental illnesses. Um, protective factors are factors that can actually promote good uh, mental health. Um, and these include family and community support, uh, social coping and problem solving skills, uh, parental supervision, economic security, and a stable home life. Um, being able to understand these different factors and being able to point them out, um, perhaps we can uh, you know, uh, address that, okay, maybe there is a um, a negative relationship in our work environment can then help us point to factors that are um, contributing to these negative um, experiences and then um, resolve them in order to create um, better mental health outcomes. Yes, and so the next topic or theme uh, that might come up and you might ask yourself, what are some barriers to seeking mental health services? So these are the most common reasons that continue to pop out as some barriers for just generally for populations. It's um, the desire, they want to receive care, but that stigma, um, and we talk about stigma, is like that negative association that if you receive help, you're going to get judged, people are going to, um, that shame, right? You're going to feel embarrassed. So that is often, not oftentimes, that's something that may prevent an individual from seeking the support that they need. They don't want to um, feel embarrassed or shame. Also thinking about culture, right? Maybe in culture, seeking mental health, it's, it's like, oh, that's a big taboo, like, no, you cannot do that. It's all in your head. So that limits the person from even going to their support system, whoever that may be. Um, lack of anon anonymous, I cannot say that word, anonymous, but that's what it means when seeking treatment. So um, I know that sometimes graduate, um, graduate students that I work with will say, well, I don't want people to know that I went to to the counseling department because you know I, I don't want my students to know I'm a TA. Um, so you want to keep in mind that your information does remain anonymous when you're getting these these services, right? So no one's gonna go and tell your your like let's say I'm in a class with Hamali. No one's gonna reach out to Hamali and tell her that I went to CAPS or whatnot. So your information does remain anonymous, but some folks they don't they don't know because um, they're scared to get that support or they, they, they just need to get more information about it. And lack of culturally competent care. So sometimes a person might not feel connected to their therapist. And it, that is a very important um, 
piece. You want to have that relationship with your therapist, right? Because you're talking to them. You want to feel connected. So sometimes that can be very challenging. And what and oftentimes I tell whoever I'm working with, well, if that therapist didn't work, let's try another one. Let's try another one that might work. So, right, let's not give up and find the support that you need. Next one is affordability to care. So some insurance companies may only cover a li limited number of visits. Um, sometimes services are usually too expensive to pay out of pocket. So that might prevent someone from seeking mental health services. And transportation, maybe the person doesn't have money to, to put gas in their car or to rent an Uber to go seek the support that they need. So these are some barriers. I'm gonna pause right there and I'm now gonna ask this space what other barriers um, do you think might prevent someone from seeking mental health services that were not mentioned under these larger categories? Go, uh, go ahead, Dr. Vasquez. Yes, I would say language. Uh, not mm. speaking the same language, it might be one of the biggest uh, barriers along with cultural uh, you know, understanding. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? And feel free to put it on the group chat. You don't have to unmute yourself, whatever you feel comfortable with. Go ahead, hey, Molly. I think this kind of goes along with... Um, some other things that we've already mentioned about the ability to actually receive care, but uh, one of them is just not having the time to actually uh, mm. go and find uh, a therapist. Um, I know especially uh, graduate student parents have a hard time um, with, you know, they even have a hard time finding daycare for their kids and mm. actually finding themselves in situations where they have to um you know go to a therapist carve out that time that just feels as if do should I be doing this it almost feels selfish yeah right um and I I'm so um what's the correct word thank you for bringing that up right so you said being selfish for taking care of yourself and that's often a, a, a topic that can be very challenging when uh, people are working with folks, right? And it's important to note that you have to put yourself first. You have to make time for yourself because if you're not 100, you cannot give it back to others. And that is often a concept that is very hard, especially um, when you tie in culture into it and all those aspects. But it's important to put yourself first. It's in a... Um, I always use the example, like when you're on an airplane, what do they tell you? You have to put on your mask first before you can help the person next to you, because you have to, that's the only way you'll be like a hundred percent to give it your all to others. Other things are um, access, documentation status, lack of knowing where to go. Yes. Where's the right place? Judgment from others, including family members. Absolutely. All of those can be barriers. And um, thank you so much for all sharing those different um those different comments, generational and cultural factors. Absolutely. And this is why workshops like this, spaces like this are key, are crucial because we're opening up the dialogue. We're having these conversations. And as a collective, we're, we're trying to break down those barriers. So more people feel more encouraged, empowered to seek help. So we have another mentee question. Um, so for this particular question, how can the academy, when I talk about the academy, is Dr. Vasquez's group um, support graduate students experiencing mental health concerns? So let's take a few moments to answer that question. Let me bring up the responses, Molly, please. Okay. 
I think we're still waiting on responses. Oh, that's a different question. Um, Oh, okay, okay. So your question has imposter syndrome. Uh, so we took that out, y'all, but but it's just, it's still the same question. Break the stigma, talk more about lived, lived experiences of grad students. Mm -hmm. What else? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Encouraging therapy. Anything else? And this information is important as Dr. Vasquez and her team are creating uh, the other workshop series, she can utilize this information, um, which will be very helpful. Safe place with others that understand meetings on campus. Yes, that's very important. Um, go ahead, Himali. No, I, I can't type it out because I'm sharing screen. Um, but I also wanted to mention that um, one thing that we often uh, find is that there is a lack of understanding between uh, people like often our mentors um, mm. and ourselves uh, about mental health struggles and creating ways where um, you know pr professors faculty are also involved in uh, thinking through these ideas being educated uh, about mm. them and actively discussing them in things like meetings uh, is I think very important and so engaging well literally the faculty uh, for these is one um major um thing i think absolutely patricia did you have something to say or you were just supporting himali's comment yeah i was just supporting himali's comment um about specifically um uh advisors as mm. perhaps extending um, their role as academic advisors to more so mentorship um, mm -hmm. and support when when a student could be experiencing um, distress or like the languishing so to avoid it from um, I guess yeah and further affecting their mental health yes absolutely and you you both raised a great uh like topic and concern, right? Uh, faculty are your first responders and always and thinking outside of that, right? When people think of mental health, automatically they think counseling, but it's not just the counseling department's job to support mental health and increase um, resources and whatnot. It's the job of everyone in this community. So if we all learn about what is available, then there's more likely uh, that are, there's a higher rate that students will be able to, you know, reach that flourishing because they know where things are, they feel supported. So we do have our first responders being faculty in the sense that they're always with students, right, in the classrooms. Um, so it is important for them to get trained, know what to look for and how to support their students if that time is is uh, is needed and when it is needed. And um, so that is very important. Yes. All right. So we can keep going. And I'll pass it on to Himali. Yeah, so we're going to then round it up with um, talking about some resources that are available to us, um, ways to seek help. Um, so if we can go out to the next slide. Um, so these are just, just some general uh, ideas about what to do, how to cultivate better mental health um, and well-being, um, getting professional help if needed. That is like Dr. Marmaleho said, um, not the only way, staying connected with others, um, staying positive, getting physical activities, helping others, getting enough sleep, developing coping skills. Um, particularly, um, I want to say that uh, helping others is something that I've personally, you know, found uh, is very beneficial. Um, 
doesn't necessarily have to be something big that you do, just helping someone out with, I don't know, let me let me sit down and listen uh, to uh, how your day went. And sometimes that can help people uh, take a burden off of their mind or just um, helping someone just open the door for someone even <laughs> makes me feel better because they thank me and I'm like, okay, I feel valued. <laughs> um, but uh, some uh, strategies that I think are um, more ap applicable to a graduate school, if we can go to the next slide, please, um, include, um, well, exercise, taking mental breaks. Um, I Particularly, mental breaks is one that I've had uh, personally some uh, difficulty um, interpreting, <laughs> I want to say, because sometimes taking a mental break is, does that mean that I switch from reading to maybe watching television um, uh, doesn't really work. Um, I think something that can be done with your hands usually is somehow more engaging. Like um, I like to, I, it's so basic. I like to do coloring, for instance. I just have like a bunch of adult coloring books, like, you know, Shakespeare's World or something like that. Uh, but also juggling, I've heard, is something great. Uh, playing with stuff like clay, like, you know, the the dough kind of thing that we used to play as kids um, is another one. Um, social, uh, obviously, like scheduling FaceTime with partners or something uh, like just hanging out with other people, even taking a little bit of time outside of my day, just calling up uh, my family, like my sister really is one thing that I really like to do. Um, breathing exercises for emotional self-care, spiritual, spend some time in nature, um, you know, go for a walk or something like that. Also checks off the physical exercise part um, and time management, celebrating wins when it comes to work. Um, it can be really overwhelming, especially when it's, you know, we're in final season or we have uh, some last minute deadlines we have to make when it comes to grant writing and things. But um, taking breaks, even in these small ways, uh, such as uh, visualizations, I've also heard uh, uh, myself uh, benefited from. Um, really just disengaging from screens, from reading, from something that just makes me sit in that same physical space um, is one big way that um, even for five minutes can improve my mental health um, in that day. Um, if we can go to the next one then. Um, yeah, before, so, sorry, Himali, too, yeah. um, I did want to interject. Can we go to, back to the slide um, that Himali was sharing? Again, it is, like I was sharing initially, you need to take time to practice self-care. Like it's very important. It's not selfish. Even if it is 30 minutes in your day, whatever that may look like. And I've worked with graduate students and they'll tell me, Connie, I have no time at all. And I'm like, okay, let me figure out your schedule. I said, you need to go to the restroom, right? And I'll make a joke, right? Not just, just go to the restroom, but like even putting water in your face, looking in the mirror and telling how amazing you are, just removing yourself from that. Let's say this is your area that you're always working, removing yourself from that space, even if it's for five minutes to get some fresh air is very important. So creating as your as time management, if you are creating your calendar, your schedule, whether it's on your Google calendar, your planners, the way you schedule meetings with your PI, with your advisor, with your labs, you schedule meetings with yourself. So that is key. Every day you schedule a meeting with yourself and you do something that brings you joy. So whether it is watching one episode of Netflix, not an entire season, because I could do that sometimes, right? So one episode of Netflix or um, playing video games, whatever it may be, listening to music, having that distraction is key. Are you going to feel stressed? Absolutely, because that stress from school doesn't go away. Like you're always thinking about it in back of your head. But what you can do at the moment is distract yourself. So going out and spending time with your friends or family, it's not going to take away from that workload, right? It's like that workload still going to be there and you can go back to it, but you're going to feel much better because you at least engage in things that distracted you for whatever that time may be. So always keep that in mind. Now we go into the activity. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, because I think that kind of um, segues really well into um, what we're one of the things that we want to like have people take away from today is so we've discussed a few strategies um, for how we can take care of ourselves. Um, we're eager to hear what other strategies people may use, may have heard of, um, and perhaps also just um, take a few minutes right now to come up with a plan for how we can incorporate self-care into our routines. Um, and if people are comfortable with it, we will also share it. Uh, with each other. So let's take about five minutes. Um, I don't know, we can play some music in the background, but go ahead and create like a plan for you this week. So it's Monday. So during the week, what are you going to do to practice self-care? So what can you do today to practice self-care Tuesday, whatnot, and then we'll bring it back and share out. Or Himali, um, can you share some music? I'm sorry, but my Zoom doesn't have the approvals to share sounds. Thank you. I'll try and do it. Thank you. Okay, I think I got it. So let's share the screen. We'll share the slide. <laughs> And then I'll share, share sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's Do you hear the beats? Yes. These are yes, low five you. beats. <laughs> that my students always recommend.
we're bringing it back. Um, so that, as you can see, I purposely put some music as y'all were working on that. That's a form of distracting yourself, calming yourself. Like these beats really can set the tone for as you're working on a project or whatever that may be. So that's an example of a skill. So at this moment, does anybody want to share uh, what strategies they might consider this week to incorporate self-care? And then Himali, do you want to read some of those responses? Yes. Um, just to check, though, is my is my video stable? Or I think I was lagging. Just uh, okay. I'm back. Um, so I'm reading some responses from the chat. I'm planning on getting back into daily meditation. That's that's a really good one. Uh, chunking, like putting together pieces of time, I guess. Um, and rather than, you know, just straight up burning out into whatever task you have to finish, uh, yoga and brunch with friends, um, gardening, that's, that's a great one. Um, again, you know, engaging our hands into activity rather than just staring at screens. Um, personally, something that I, uh, thought of, um, uh, just now was, um, kind of one of Inter intersects with the social interaction um, aspect that we were going through is um, just a checking in with people that um, in the classes that I'm taking or in, at any sort of uh, social uh, sort of setting uh, or non-social setting, work setting, I may uh, find myself in um, because um, I think rather than just um, rushing from one place to another that would also create some space for me to actively just um, calm down and share space with other people. Um, there are others as well in the chat, uh, practicing mindfulness techniques, scheduling breaks, absolutely, scheduled space to do nothing, writing a gratitude list, uh, shift sleep schedule by 20 minutes, um, another one is work less, which uh, I absolutely agree with. I think we all work way too much and we sometimes do actually need to just schedule. Yes, um, I think for me, I'm going to give myself some grace. I just got back from a conference and my inbox is flooded. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm going to get to it when I get to it, because sometimes I have the urge, like I got, I need to get this inbox down to zero and reply to everyone. And it's just causing more stress on me. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get to it when I get to it. Um, and just think, appreciate everyone for their patience. Uh, here, here's my reply. So um, just, I, I say that, but give all of yourself some grace as you're doing whatever you need to do, because everyone is at capacity, everyone is um, is feeling it, right? There's just a lot of demand. So just take time to recharge. Thank you so much for sharing. So that was one skill set that we wanted you all to take from this workshop. Um, oh, I love a passion. Oh my gosh, love passion planners. I am the color scheme queen if you look at my outlook I like everything organized so yes that really helps me stay on on top of things I love that um, okay so we can go on to the next slide okay. uh, the other thing that we wanted to have you all leave with was the ability to learning to articulate or expressing your feelings. Now we talked about mental health, we talked about mental illness. So it's important to really articulate how you're feeling at the moment and why you're feeling that way, right? If you're not able to express yourselves, it's very challenging for others to understand what is going on. So students who can manage emotions know how to regulate their emotions in a stressful situation. So for example, when I'm feeling stressed, I know what I need to do to calm myself down, right? I know the strategies. So you also know 
when you know how to articulate and know how to express yourself, you're able to maintain good social relationships with others, which is key as a graduate student, right? So these are just not just romantic relationships. This could be your, your relationships with your peers, your relationships with your, your faculty, your advisor. So other, one other activity that we wanted to do today is we wanted to do the feeling wheel. Put a thumbs up if you, if you if you know about the feeling wheel, has heard of the feeling wheel, has done the feeling wheel. Let's see. Give me a thumbs up, okay, to people. Thumbs down. Give me a thumbs down if you've never heard of the feeling wheel. <laughs> okay. All right. So I personally love doing this and I do this oftentimes with my team. So for this activity, we're going to do a daily reflection. Um, so at the end of the day, take a moment to contemplate and look at the wheel and really express what did you experience today? So what do I mean by that? We can go to the next slide. So when you look at the feeling wheel, like, Connie, what feeling wheel? I'm going to show you in the next slide. It's not on this slide. But you want to explore the emotions you're experiencing. So when I show the slide, the next slide, you want to begin with the more general emotions in the center of the feet of the wheel. So when I show it in the center of the wheel, it'll have different main topics. So, for example, let's say you're feeling sad. Then you want to move towards the outer emotions and identify the specific emotions you are feeling. So you're going to see um, in the blue segment the other emotions, right? Then you want to accept that emotion that you're feeling. So if I'm feeling sad, let's let's backtrack. Let's say, for example, I'm feeling guilty. What is associated with feeling guilty? Feeling sad. And why am I feeling sad? It's because I'm feeling remorseful. There's an outer layer, right? All these three themes are connected to each other, and that can give you an, exa an example to self-reflect and really have a space where you can really engage and describe why you're feeling, how you're feeling, and communicate your emotions to others in a healthy way, right? So am I, I'm feeling ashamed. Why am I feeling ashamed? It's related to feeling sad, but where did that come from? I was feeling stupid. That was the outer layer. Does that make sense? So take a moment to do the daily reflection today, and you don't have to share this out. So I'm going to give you about like one minute to try to do this feeling wheel on your own. And if you have any questions, let me know. If you want to share out, you definitely can. And we can explore this a bit more. Go ahead, Lisa. So just a question where it says like sad, guilty, and remorseful. Is remorseful the only option for guilty? Or is it sad, could it be depressed, and then remorseful? Or do the they line up with the they line up with the um, emotion that is the experience. They do. So once you, let's say, for instance, once you find guilty, let's say you're feeling guilty on the middle of the band of the wheel, you can see that the associated core feeling near the center is sad. That's the core feeling. And the more specific nuanced feeling is feeling remorseful. So they're connected. Okay. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So again, this is just a personal activity you can do on your own to really reflect at the end of the day why you're feeling how you're feeling if you need to be communicate with someone those emotions, right? Because they're connected to something. Um, so that's really helpful when for folks that struggle with uh, explaining themselves to others. Communication is key. So maybe if, let's say, for instance, you're going into a therapy session and you want to be able to expand yourself a little bit more, the feeling wheel is a helpful tool as to set a foundation. Let's see. I use an app called How We Fell, an Apple Store that works, and it also has Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Patricia, for sharing that. So if y'all want to download that app, that's very helpful. Any questions on this? No? Okay. Then we can keep going. Okay, go ahead, Himali. Yeah. Um, I think uh, could we go back to the presentation? Um, we're just going to, yes, here we are. So we're just going to round off with uh, some of the resources. So these are uh, specific to uh, University of California, Riverside, um, CAPS being the counseling um, uh, 
and I'm, I'm forgetting, I'm completely forgetting what it stands for right now, uh, right, counseling and psychological services. Um, uh, in order to make an appointment, one thing that I didn't know initially was that uh, these also offered group therapy sessions. Um, so that is extremely helpful uh, to know. Um, it has these counterparts also exist on other um, UC campuses. So you would also have something also most likely called the CAPS uh, Center that you can call to make appointments. Case management is um, for more serious um, uh, long-term problems. Um, the well um, is a non-clinical, I take it, health education uh, program uh, where um, this is sort of going back into what we have talked about rather than just uh, engaging with mental illness where these are resources for supporting mental health. Um, and um, there, there have been similar efforts at other UC campuses as well. So if you look around, you'll uh, likely find um, some form of um, mental health uh, engagement activities that are taking uh, place on campus. Um, and then we're going to move to off-campus resources. These are for referral to health services. Um, one particular, the CARES line, I think the one that's listed here is for uh, Riverside, but it also exists at other um, um, places um, around um, California, which are essentially that um, usually maintained by the counties um, for helping people who are on Medi-Cal, for instance, to um, be referred to community health care services. Um, if we could then go on to the next slide. Um, um, real quickly before we do move on um, to CAPS. So um, one common myth that I hear a lot of students say that they, CAPS only offers eight sessions. So CAPS is your counseling and psychological department here at UCR. They don't only offer eight sessions. So it's as many sessions as you need. It is acute therapy. So um, after you do graduate, they want to make sure that they connect you to other resources, whether it's in the county or um, in other areas. So they want to make sure that they provide that clinical therapy support. They do have group sessions for graduate students. And I did drop on the link here on how to like make an appointment and get more information. Yeah. Case management are your path clears. So if you're struggling with housing, with basic needs, um, with academics, having issues with your PI, case management is a great resource. They do not provide therapy, although they're licensed. They um, provide that, that, that immediate support. Therapy is CAPS. And then we have the well, which is my department. We do provide mental health education and promotion but it's non-clinical. So our peer coaching is being led by one of my graduate students. And that's a perfect space for a graduate student that wants to learn how to manage their time, how to practice self-care. We create an acute actionable plan for you. So when you leave, you're able to get the support that you need. Where do students access case management? Great question. I'll drop the link on the group chat. So they're located on Bannockburn. And the way they work is that you, the student will fill out an application, and then the case manager will reach out to them. Another great tool about case management is that, let's say you're concerned as a faculty or as a staff or as a peer about another student, you can reach out to case management, let them know you're concerned about this student, and case management, without disclosing anything, will just send like a very casual email and reach out to that student to see, um, to see just to check in and see if they're okay. So I'll drop the link in a bit, um, and then I'll continue to the next, or I don't know, Dr. Vasquez, as I'm presenting the next slide, can you drop the case management link for me? Or I can do it, Walter. We can move on to national resources. Okay, and then, all right. Um, so those are your UCR and then off-campus resources. Um, so thank you so much, Hamali, for sharing that. And I'll drop the link right now. Um, let me know if you got it. The screen's showing black on my end. Can y'all see it? Okay, I cannot see anything, but I can definitely look on my end for the sake of time. Oh, so some, go ahead. 
Yeah, do you want me to share the screen? The national resources? Yes, the PowerPoint. Yeah, the national, okay, mm -hmm. yes, great, thank you. Thank you. So, so um, I did drop the case management link, but other resources that are available to everyone is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, so that is the link. I, I for some reason I think the number is nine eight eight. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but that's Lisa. Is that correct? The new text line. Yeah. Okay. So if students. Uh, oh, it's right there. It's right in front of me. It's been a long day, y'all. So the 988, it's this new suicide and crisis lifeline. So if you text, if you send a text there, you will get help. Um, we still want to refer students to the county lifeline, um, which is the 211 that was in the previous slide. Um, so that is going to connect you. So, so the reason why we, we tell students to do 211 is that they are well-versed with Riverside County. The 988 line still doesn't have an actual office in Riverside County. So you're actually contacting folks in LA County. So they might not be as familiar as Riverside County folks. So both are great resources, but I still promote 211 first over 988 but still give both resources to the person if they need it. Then there's SAMHSA, and then there's also the National Alliance on Mental Illness. They all have grants and uh, great information and research studies if you want to get more information. And then we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so ways you can participate is uh, Dr. Vasquez and her team does have upcoming upcoming co-learning events. Um, they have a lot of opportunities. They always involve graduate students and a lot of the work that they do, as well as professional students to create informed decisions. Um, with that being said, we also would like to kindly ask you if you can please take the post event survey so they can gather this information and really um, improve further workshops as they continue this series. So I'll give you about 15 seconds to scan that QR code. Okay, wonderful, that's even better. So for accessibility, there's also the link on the group chat. Would you like me to keep going, Dr. Vasquez? I know it says five minutes. Yeah. I think if we can just take two minutes for, okay, go ahead. for this, um, it's really important for us to hear from your perspectives. So remember that from, um, from this capacity building project, what we are trying to do is also highlighting some of the, um, of the topics that patients uh, are recommending for future research, but specifically some topics that focused on the mental health of historically marginalized graduate and professional students. Also remember that responses are, um, um anonymous so we will not uh, record any personal information so thank you for taking the time to to fill out this survey thank you As we're filling out our surveys, just uh, one other thing is uh, Dr. Mamadeu mentioned, we are continuing with these workshop series um, as well. Uh, so in next week, we have one on structural factors and mental health disparities. Then we have a couple of workshops in May. And you can also look forward to our um, podcast series that will be developed uh, soon enough and be available in June. Um, I realize we're almost at the end. Um, so we just wanted to signal other ways that you can get involved if you would like to give feedback for um, how to better like improve the academy for graduate students. Um, one is the University of California Student Mental Health Oversight Committee, which makes policies regarding um, student mental health engagement on different campuses. They also collect data about this. So um, if you want to get in uh, touch with them, uh, you can either email Christian Jacobs 
the, uh, in the email address um, or also get in touch with the University of California Graduate and Professional Council. Uh, we have a mental health advisory committee um, and the people on it will be more than happy to help represent concerns um, to uh, the UC um, Student Mental Health Oversight Committee and other members that we can reach out to. Um, also use your graduate student association as resources. Um, they, will, they will also always know who to put you in touch with um, when it comes to these. Lastly, um, the UC also has its graduate student um, uh, experience survey um, this year. And I will also just maybe drop this in the chat. Um, just um, this is extremely like I, the link I've sent is it says UCD, but it should give you the option of like selecting which um, part of the UC system that you come from. But this is this also has a section on well-being, um, and as we've discussed today, it does gather uh, information about a lot of other metrics of, on mental health, um, and is often referred uh, to when you know giving concrete data sets. Um, when talking to graduate students. So this is, and the results for this will then be available next year. Um, and that brings us to the end, um, almost. Uh, visit the website linked here, Healing the Academy. Um, please follow us on Twitter, Healing Higher Ed. Um, please give us feedback and thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much to our presenters. I'm going to stop recording.